So I realize I've thrown a lot at you guys um, in this lab, this first part of the presentation. So I'm going to try to give you sort of the ever so briefest um, synopsis of some performance artists, some really important performance artists to the development of performance theory. Um, I cut a bunch of them out um, just for time's sake, and we'll probably, I'll try to get back to them over the course of the semester, but I think um, less is more in this situation that I'll sort of just break down some of um, the performance artists and give you sort of a very general um, history of some of those ideas and focus that they have in their work. So performance art and where we get the development of performance theory really begins in the 60s and 70s. We have Dada um, being a big part of that um, that we saw. Situationalist, fluxus, installation art, conceptual art. We have the challenging of theater. Um, it's interdisciplinary, something that can't be purchased and different every time. Artists, again, are still dealing with this idea and trying to rethink it. Um, and we'll see that in performances, but... Um, Museums have easily adapted to this and purchased performances, um, if you can believe that. Uh, this includes elements such as time, space, performer's body, and the relationship between performer and audience. The book talked about fluxus as a type of um, maybe subsection to performance art, um, which is a group that developed this manifesto with George Massianus. Uh, fluxus resisted transformations of life into art, believing that the two were already inseparable. They played a lot with kind of these constructions um, of uh, gender and sexuality as well in their Fluxus wedding between George Masinas, Masinas and Billy Hutchins, um, where they had sort of a quote unquote wedding, um, but then they wore sort of the traditional garb, but then switched um, places and took over each other's dress. So I have a video of that. Um, as well as some of these pictures here. And if you can't tell, um, this is a man um, wearing this outfit and dress. There was a wig that was exchanged between the two figures. I think some of the most, where you kind of see the beginning of performance art, um, quote unquote performance art of the 60s and 70s, really happens with Alan Capro and his work. It's really kind of where we talk about some of the uh, start to the idea of performance art. Opening as Alan Capro described it is something spontaneous, something that just happens to happen. Um, and he staged this in a gallery space. So he created this kind of weird interactive space where all of these rooms were divided um, and made sort of into different sort of sections of this performance. You would have a room where actors entered and exited and these kind of fragmented events. And a lot of them was kind of art of the everyday and everyday tasks or events. And it was really about sort of kind of just having a place where people participated and how um, it was something, right, completely couldn't be commodified, couldn't be remade because although actors had scripts, right, they're all kind of each performance is kind of unique in its own capacity, and these people would just kind of enact everyday things, um, like uh, painting or playing instruments or um, whatever. I have a, a description here. Lasting for 90 minutes, the 18 simultaneous performances included painters painting a canvases, procession of performers, readings from place cards, or placards, I'm sorry, the playing of musical instruments and ended with two performers saying single syllable words like but and well as four huge scrolls fell from the horizontal bar between them. The end of the event was signaled by a bell ringing twice. So while it feels like this work kind of has no mm, social theme or purpose, it's really about just kind of reinventing the idea of art um, and performance. So Alan Capro did a lot of this, like with his work yard, in which it was an exhibition space where people would just kind of come and play with tires. Um, other works included fluids. Um, he would he posted this poster um, called Fluids, a happening by Alan Capro, in which it read, during three days, about 20 rectangular, <coughs> excuse me, enclosures of ice blocks measuring about 30 feet wide, a 10 are 30 feet long, 10 wide, and 8 high, are built throughout the city. Their walls are unbroken. They are left to melt. 
and he got volunteers from different colleges to come and create these works. Um, and they would spend the whole day building these really massive ice sculptures and um, just leave them to melt, melt, right? I mean, they didn't exist, couldn't exist um, outside of that. And so it was just about the process and the literal creation and the bringing of people together um, that um, made this work um, important and valuable. So there's a recreation from 2005. As I said before, we are going to come back to Yves Klein um, in his work, um, Leap into the Void. And this was an interesting work. Um, he wanted to sort of show the practical demonstration of levitation and sort of dealing with, um, again, performances and interactions. And so he left from this building, um, and but then had this photo edited to remove the trampoline where people are waiting to catch him. Um, but he was very interested in this sort of performance actions as well. Um, I'll tell you about an artist who did this better than Klein. Um, but he really worked on this um, very important series of works called Anthropometry, Anthropometry, Anthropometries, I don't know why I can't say that word, of the Blue Period from 1960, in which he um, created this series of works in which he would use females as what he called living brushes and would put on this pure color, right, this international blue color that he invented. And he would direct the individuals to cover themselves in paint and then press their bodies up against um, these pieces of paper, thus creating these silhouettes. The symphony plays and it's about this kind of chance and spontaneity and the performance as a whole um, and sort of with them the creation of the work at the end of it. And here is it. Now, I would suggest watching this video because you kind of get the sense um, of my distaste for Klein in that although people have talked about how, oh, he was so nice to these women and they were a part of the exhibition, um, Calling women living brushes and utilizing them as paintbrushes on a canvas in kind of this exploitative way um, is really not at the core of um, performance art sort of in any capacity and also really undermines women um, in the artistic community as sort of, again, objects to be displayed and utilized for your end product. Um, so I'm not the biggest fan of Yves Klein. It's really weird to watch. Um, I would definitely suggest taking a look at it because it's just like the weirdest thing. This is another work mentioned kind of in the same um, boat from the book, um, this sh Shroud Anthropometry. We have a uh, minimalist artist coming and participating in performance art as well. This is Robert Morris um, in his production of Sight with Carolee Schleeman, who I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, this work was created in the Judson Dance Theater in which he created this structure. He wore a mask. Of his own face um, and built a structure that first um, revealed Carolee Schleeman posed as Manet's Olympia and then reclosed it again. So some interesting connections with um, process and theater um, as well as a connection with Manet's work. We also had artists literally making themselves sort of into um, living sculptures with Gilbert and George in some of their works. Um, they created their sort of live body as the object itself. Um, they made work such as Underneath the Arches in which they kind of made themselves into um, what kind of looks like robotic um, sculptures. And they would paint their faces gold and their suits and they would move in this mechanical way. And it was supposed to collapse the idea between the artist and the art and the live body as the art object, traditionally talking about forms, again, of art. This is an object, unlike a sculpture, that can't be purchased. Um, and they sang this song about um, homelessness and hope um, during the Great Depression. So I would definitely suggest watching this video um, of them singing because it's really strange and gives you kind of a, a feeling about um, like when you go and see robotic um, bodies singing in a museum. Joseph Boys is a really out there performance artist. Um, he had kind of a weird life in dealing with 
um, sort of his life after World War II and work um, fighting in World War II. And a lot of his works involve sort of ritual and transformation um, and thinking about sort of changing your consciousness and your ideas. Um, this is his work, How to Explain Pictures to a Dead Hair, um, which is about what it sounds like. Um, he covered his face in honey and gold leaf. He held a hair and carried it around this exhibition and he would whisper things into the hare's ears and touch the paws of the dead animal to um, different works and I would try to explain them to him. Um, and all the while, while the gallery viewers stood outside of the exhibition and watched him kind of do this, um, he was kind of talking about this mystery and ritual between animal and human forms. He also was thinking about himself as a shaman, but he did some interesting things like debilitating himself and he strapped this big metal piece to his foot, um, along with having this weird golden face. Um, this Here's a description for you. At the beginning of the performance, boys locked the gallery doors from the inside, leaving the gallery goers outside. They could observe the scene with, within only through the windows. With his head entirely coated in honey and gold leaf, he began to explain pictures to a dead hare, whispering to the dead animal on his arm in an apparent dialogue. He processed through the exhibits from artwork to artwork. Occasionally he would stop and return to the center of the gallery, where he stepped over a dead fir tree that lay on the floor. After three hours, the public was let into the room. Boys sat up in the stool and entrance area with the hare on his arm and his back to the onlookers. Um, Boyce has commented on his use of a hair um, and sort of his connection with animals and dead animals. He said the hair has a strong affinity to women, to birth and to menstruation, and generally to chemical transformation of the blood. That's what the hair demonstrates to us all when he hollows out this form, the movement of incarnation. The hair incarnates himself into the earth, which is what we human beings can only radically achieve with our thinking. He rubs, pushes, and digs himself into materia, earth finally penetrates its laws. Through this work, his thinking is sharpened, then transforms and becomes revolutionary. Even a dead animal, boys mused in a statement on his action, preserves more powers of intuition than some human beings with their stubborn rationality. Ouch. Um, human thinking was capable of achieving so much, but it could also be intellectualized to a deadly degree and remain dead and express its deadliness in political and pedagogical fields. So he's very much kind of dealing with all these ideas of ritual and animal consciousness and um, overall sort of a weird and complicated performance. Another one of his works that he did, he flew into the United States in his work, I Like America and America Likes Me, in which he shared a space um, with a wild coyote for seven days. And he wanted to reflect on the American Indian, um, aka a Native American um, persecution. Um, he wanted to see nothing inside the United States. So instead, he was kind of like, he flew to New York. He was picked up in an ambulance and swathed in felt, which you can see here, and um, taken to the Wren Block Gallery. And then he lived with this wild, wild coyote for eight hours a day for the next three days until, interestingly enough, um, the coyote and him kind of became friends and connected to each other in this symbolic way. And then at the end of the three days, he was transported back and never saw a piece of American soil. So wanted to talk about the connection between Native Americans in the land and how um, they're sort of pulled away from this space and also sort of commenting on um, their persecution while also dealing with some interesting ideas of animals and um, space as well. I'm going to mention Laurie Anderson very briefly. She's kind of in the musical field of performance and um, sort of enacting work. Um, she makes, she made music that was very much, um, if you watch it, very much part of the 80s and 90s. I have two videos for you. Um, but playing with some of the ideas of digital and electronic media as well as experimental theater in her work. Um, they're really funny to watch and really weird about kind of narration and storytelling. Um, in sort of her musical productions. Um, so a very different approach to um, performance art. Now, as a subsection of 
performance art, we have body art. And this is where you get some of the really complex um, conversation about social critique. And really sort of powerful because the artist is taking their own body and using it as a subject or object of the work. It's very unflinchingly real. It usually uses their body in sort of um, dramatic and painful um, ways to sort of push them to the limit of what their flesh can experience. Um, and so they're sort of forced to witness private violent acts against one's own body. So I do have this warning in, warning in here. Um, there are no artists that are raped um, in this work, but they're definitely dealing with some of these constructs and ideas, so I want you to be aware of it, especially when we start getting into conversations um, about um, women and women's bodies. Uh, we're gonna start out talking about men's, um, which mostly is just violent in some capacities, um, but I just wanted to warn you that um, some of them are a little um, tricky to comprehend and also sort of deal with um, if you have sort of triggering reasons um, why these subjects, if they bother you in any way. Um, so just do your best with it um, and uh, let me know if you have any problems or anything. Uh, but um, leading into body art, we have Chris Burden. And he's a really powerful and interesting body artist um, because he really provoked kind of, I would say, m most violent um, figure against his own body in this type of um, art. For example, in Shoot in 1971, um, Burden wanted to provoke ideas about how the Vietnam War and television violence had kind of made people desensitized to pain. And so he dealt with this in a lot of his works. So Shoot, for example, um, in which he had a friend shoot him in the arm and it just grazed his arm. Um, and he wanted to talk about these ideas of violence in cinema. Um, as well as sort of some sadistic ideas. Um, I do have the video of this one, which is very short and not graphic at all um, because it happens very quickly. Um, but then he had, it didn't hurt him very much to have grazed his arm. Um, and, but then he had to go and explain it to um, a hospital, which is kind of funny, and explain how he um, asked someone to shoot him in the arm for artistic reasons. Um, but a lot of his other work, um, like Transfixed, he nailed himself to um, a Volkswagen Beetle, talking about relig ritualistic connections with his body, as well as the violence with the Vietnam War as well. Um, in doing this, this is um, very sort of intense and violent. Um, and here are the nails that he used, um, kind of a relic of this work. Other works include him uh, crawling across um, a blacktop filled with glass um, and the endurance that it takes to do this. Um, he's done innumerable other works like trying to drown himself. Um, he lived in, I think it was this uh, locker um, for a certain amount of days um, and uh, could only have so much like water and um, had a, like a place for feces, but would sort of had to live in this little space um, for five days. Um, he set himself on fire. He's had himself kicked down the stairs. So again, really dealing with a lot of these limits of the physical body um, and what it can take and what this kind of violence means in our society today. Um, very sort of cryptic and dark. Um, Chechin Hasai has dealt with a lot of these ideas as well in his work. Um, as I mentioned with Yves Klein, I told you I was going to bring this up again. Um, his He had created a jump piece as well. Um, I'm unaware if he knew about Yves Klein's or not, um, but he literally jumped out of a two-story building in Taiwan um, and had his friend photograph it in which he broke both of his ankles. Um, so he actually didn't have anyone to catch him at the bottom at all. Um, but he wanted to comment kind of um, on, he started creating actions and kind of thought the community of Taiwan was very limiting. And so he went um, to New York City to kind of pursue work. And his work, similarly to Burden, deals with um, kind of pushing his body to the limit, but in a very different way. So he creates these one-year performances um, in which he has to do a particular thing with particular rules for an entire year. So this one in particular from 78 to 79, he um, 
locked himself in a human cage. He was not allowed to read or talk or write or listen to radio or TV. And he um, never left the cage. He had someone who would bring him food, remove waste, and take a photograph. Um, people could come and visit him in the gallery space um, twice a month, but otherwise he was left totally to his thoughts. Um, and it was about his endurance in space um, and alone. He's also done works like uh, this one from 81 to 82, in which he was required to live outside uh, for an entire year, and very much kind of dealing with some of the homelessness issues in New York City at the time and commenting on them. Um, he made this document, I shall stay indoors for one year, never go inside, I shall not go into a building, subway, train, car, airplane, ship, cave or tent. I shall have a sleeping bag. The performance shall begin on this date and end on this date. So there were different constrictions to like if he had to go inside for some reason to get food or whatever, but um, he um, stayed outside in the winter in New York City um, to contemplate sort of homelessness in New York City. And other works like um, Living Art Piece, where he was literally tied to um, another artist, Linda Montano, for an entire year. Um, and uh, they collaborated with one another with this kind of eight feet of slack between them. So again, dealing with these kind of connections between space and um, figural connection as well. Um, that's something we can do right now, right? Um, Haha, ha, that's not really funny. Um, Vito Conchi is another one of those artists that really pushes his body and his practice to really limits of violence and exploitation. Um, he really believed that a lot of viewers were kind of passive um, viewers to art. They really had no connection and no interaction, and he wanted to um, change that. So in works like Trademarks, um, he created these performances where he literally bit himself as hard as he could on different parts of his body and then used printer's ink um, to make imprints of them, literalizing the idea of artists as maker, but also trying to make things that can't necessarily be bought and sold. Um, he also did works like Following Piece, um, in which he followed people randomly around New York City. He... Um, he could choose anybody and he could follow them until they entered a building and sometimes they would last a few minutes um, other times a few hours and he would move all around New York um, sort of having a conversation between the artist and the viewer right you have this sort of weird stalkery connection as an artist kind of follows someone around and goes into their private space right um, but it also puts control into the viewers hands even though they don't know they have it um, because they would lead him into wherever um, wherever he they would go, he would go. Now, probably one of his most controversial pieces was Seedbed from 1972. And this was a really strange work um, in which we had the gallery space here on the left that the viewer would come in and walk through. And... Um, it didn't have any space in it, and all the the viewer could sort of hear was sounds um, and sort of um, random words and language and didn't really know what was going on. Um, and later on, it was revealed that uh, Vito Conchi was underneath this, so they built up the gallery um, into this space so that Vito Conchi could be underneath it. And he had a screen where he would watch the different figures and he would masturbate to the individuals in the gallery and he would narrate what he was thinking out loud to them, um, which was then projected into the gallery space. So as you can imagine, this was super controversial, super crazy. Um, it was about trust and violation, what was sexual, what was ethical, the public versus private, right? You're kind of... Um, he was kind of um, interjecting himself into this personal space of people and kind of sexually abusing them in sort of a verbal way and then masturbating to them. I mean, if you had done this straight to someone's face, um, can you imagine, right? But kind of about this intimate connection between the visitor and the artist. Um, neither of them had personal sort of connection with one another, physical, um, but um, very sort of graphic in the way that... Um, the artist kind of used his power um, to sort of sexually invade their space. 
Now, with artists, um, with female artists, I feel like performance art kind of went in a very different direction. I really have some familiarity with Yoko Ono because of her connection with John Lennon, um, but she was uh, a performance artist and sort of general artist um, before they ever sort of met. Um, and she was living in Tokyo when the bombs were dropped um, by American forces in 45 and really wanted to um, sort of deal with some of these complex ideas about um, individual personality and the connection between um, artist and viewer. And one of her famous, most famous pieces is Cut Piece. And the, in this work, Yoko Ono sat on the stage and people were invited to come and cut pieces of her clothing off and um, could leave and keep it. And some people would come and cut very small pieces away from her clothing, while others would cut away her bra straps and shirt. Um, and it was about sort of audience participation and what it kind of means when you bring an audience group together um, and what they're sort of capable of doing. And I do have the video of this one because as you watch it, <coughs> goodness gracious, you get sort of how at first it seems kind of playful and sweet. People are um, cutting off very small portions of the clothing, being very respectful. And you have a young man come up, um, and it seems like he's kind of egged on by um, the audience, and he cuts off quite a bit of her clothing, revealing her bra, cutting off her bra straps, um, and um, sort of creating um, this kind of sexual assault of her in some capacity. And although Yoko Ono was allowed to stop the piece at any time, she really wanted to push the limits of what people were capable of doing. And we'll see this even more with Marina Abramovich, but it showed that um, when sort of left to their own devices, people were willing to kind of exploit women and exploit this situation where they could kind of take advantage of her um, as an artist. Um, very sort of powerful statement for the time. She is really well known for other works like uh, Grapefruit. This is a really fun book um, that Yoko Ono produced um, from 64 in which um, she created all these different little, it kind of reminds me of like process or conceptual art in which she created these kind of different um, things that you could do and participate in um, as little performances of your own. And then at the end of the book, it says for you to burn it, um, which I do not plan on doing with my version, my print. Um, but this is one of my favorites. Um, hide and seek peace. Hide until everybody goes home. Hide until everybody forgets about you. Hide until everybody dies. Um, from 1964 spring. So really kind of playing with this idea of conceptual art. Other important female artists, uh, Carolee Schneeman, she did a lot of different work. Um, she was really one of the founders of performance art, her Anna Marina Abramovich, um, and playing with the female body. Um, this is Eye Body in which um, she played with herself as a human canvas, um, kind of merging herself um, with paint and glue for feathers, garden snakes, glass and plastic, um, and exploring the idea of flesh as material while her friend photographed her, as well as the connection between um, female as um, figure in painting, as content in painting. Um, but her most famous work is Interior Scroll. Um, she created this work in which she entered the room in a robe and apron with two sheets disrobed and stood like being drawn and then held a sheet around her. She read from her book Cezanne. She was a great painter. Um, she dropped the sheet, retained the apron, and began to apply strokes of dark paint to her face and body. And then um, as sort of the performance uh, moved on, she finally uh, removed a scroll from her vagina um, and she read from it, um, which is a work that she wrote called Kitch's Last Meal, um, which I will post um, the text on um, Canvas so you can read it. Um, but it recounts a conversation with a structuralist filmmaker who she was possibly dating in which a male talks about what females and males should do. And so it became this sort of interesting, introspective work where she's talking about um, her vagina as sort of a physical, conceptually, um, a source of sacred knowledge and ecstasy, um, but also about kind of talking about the suppressive history 
um, of women, of orgasmic pleasure, of birth, of transformation, of menstruation, of maternity, um, and also these constructs of what women should and shouldn't do, right? And sort of literally pulling this scroll on a vagina and reading from it. So she kind of read from it as she pulled it out. Was supposed to be supposed to be this kind of insanely shocking moment for the members of the audience, and it was. It was about these historic ideas of what women should and shouldn't do, and she wanted to kind of throw them all away and make them invaluable and unimportant, um, and really insanely shocked um, the viewers of her work with this. Here's the actual scroll now, um, stained kind of weirdly. As I said, Marina Abramovich is another one of those figures who's really kind of considered one of the founders of performance art with her work. Um, our book talks about her in the context of Abramovich in Ule, which is really strange because um, nobody really... I wouldn't say that Ule is much as a household name as Marina Abramovich and not separating them, I feel like is at the core, the problem and the issue that performance art is trying to remind us that women... Um, and their bodies are just as important as males and their bodies, um, but nonetheless. Um, the reason that they mention them together is that Abramovich and Ule really um, worked as a performance duo for a long time, and he'll come up again, um, but they created works like Imponderab Imponderablia, Im a Biblia um, from 77, in which they stood naked, um, in a gallery space and people had to literally walk through the two of them naked to get to the other side of the gallery as the entranceway. So trying to kind of um, make people uncomfortable and um, talk about these ideas of the female body and the male body and sort of who they faced um, as they went in, the male or the female, right, of kind of determined their comfort level um, with the situation. But Abramovich is really known for her rhythm series. Um, she did a number of them. We're going to talk about 10, 5, and 0, um, in which she created these really um, graphic performances with her own body. So she wanted to know how sort of far she could push her physical body um, and pain and really kind of um, stretch the viewer as well. So this work in particular, she moved um, during this performance. She was recording herself and she would take a knife, you can see all these knives lined up, and she would poke them in between her fingers, um, each one of them, and um, sometimes she would hit the um, the side of her finger and sometimes she wouldn't, and she would go through each knife and do this. Um, and then in the second iteration of this, she would play back this sound of her doing it the first time and she would try to um, make it exactly the same. So that meant cutting herself in the same place as before, um, trying to do it on purpose, right? So trying to um, recreate the first performance. So again, um, it's kind of mind over matter in that she literally had to stab herself, cut herself um, in this action. Other works are involved her in Rhythm 5, in which she set this um, star on fire and threw her hair and like toenails into um, and then she ended up laying in the middle of it and passed out and people had to actually drag her body out um, because if people were afraid that she was harming herself. But um, the most sort of well-known and infamous work um, that very much connects with Yoko Ono's work is Rhythm Zero. This work she brought people together in a gallery space and she laid out this table um, and on the table it said instructions there are 72 objects on the table that one can use on me as desired performance I am the object during this period I take full responsibility duration six hours and so in doing this she had objects like a rose a feather perfume honey bread Grapes, wine, scissors, scalpel, nails, metal bar, and a gun loaded with one bullet. And after the instructions were given, um, people could do whatever they wanted to her physical body. And it kind of started out fine, um, but by the third hour, people were cutting her skin. They held the gun to her head. Um, they cut off her clothes. People, There were different factions of people who were... Um, 
sexually assaulting her and cut they were cutting her with the thorns from the roses um and other people who were trying to stop this from occurring and it created this great friction um I have this description by an art critic. It began tamely. Someone turned her around. Someone thrust her arms into the air. The Neapolitan night began to heat up. The third hour, all of her clothes were cut from her with razor blades. In the fourth hour, the same blades began to expose her skin. Her throat was slashed so someone could suck her blood. Various minor sexual assaults were carried out on her body. She was committed to the peace that she would not have resisted rape or murder. Faced with her own abdication of will, with its implied collapse of human psychology, a protective group began to define itself in the audience. When a loaded gun as, as thrust at Marina's head and her own finger was being worked around the trigger, a fight broke out between audience factions. And so as this work progressed, it really became a conversation about when people are left to their own devices, are they willing to take advantage? Are they willing to sexual assault this women? And they did. They did. They went to the extreme, right? It wasn't that these people were going to be tame and interact appropriately. It became negative. It became assaultive. And it pushed the limits um, of who she was as an individual and what she could sort of... Um, withstand and she cried during this performance and at the end when she stood up to leave people ran they thought they were going to be arrested because they had sexually assaulted this woman um and of course nothing happened um but it was really about sort of her connection with the audience members and what the audience members were willing to do if she took the responsibility off of them and as a female um allowing people if given the opportunity that they would sexually assault her now, her works have become tamer over the years. Um, that's quite a graphic work, quite violent. Um, other works have included her um, staying for 12 days in a gallery um, and did not eat or sleep or have any privacy, um, but would just spend time in this room trying to change um, the atmosphere of the space. Um, or um, her work in Artist is Present, um, in which she would sit across from a viewer or a, um, a gallery. Oh my God, what is the word I want? Um, a gallery viewer, a person who would come into the gallery to um, see the art. She would sit with them for three months, eight hours a day, and spend time with 1,000 strangers, looking them in the eyes. And it was just about connection between the um, audience members and the artist. Um, I have a video of this as well as um, the previous work from Sex in the City. Um, the house with... This work, The House with the Ocean View, was featured on Sex and the City, which is really weird. You can definitely check it out. Um, but the artist is present. Ule came back and she stared with him and they like started crying. It was very sort of um, emotional as they sort of broke up um, like 10 or 20 years ago. So I hope everyone got some sense of performance theory and performance artists. I know I gave you a very brief synopsis of what's going on sort of in um, performance theory and action at the time. Um, but think through these elements as you, as you think about Richard Checkner's work, along with that of performance artists for your discussion board post and reading response one. Um, otherwise, I will take a look at discussion posts and we will talk next week. Um, I'm super excited to get on um, and talk about um, Linda Nochlin.